so today I'm going to talk about this, uh, my recent work on uh, subtleties in the trainability of quantum machine learning models, uh, which is a uh, work from the uh, Quantum Computing Summer School at uh, Los Alamos uh, Labo National Laboratory. Uh, since we only have like, uh, like a few people, so let's just make it like super informal and, you know, anyone, uh, anytime that anyone has like any questions, just ask, okay? And uh, yeah, so the talk has like three parts. Uh, so the first two is more like introduction to like a quantum machine learning, very brief one and like rational quantum algorithms. And uh, after that, we talk about uh, specifically about the work. Uh, so I kind of like guess that you guys may already be familiar with uh, quantum machine learning and VQA to some extent. Uh, so I would try to be like very brief about it. Okay, so, okay, so quantum machine learning. So basically uh, the thing that I want everyone here to be aware is that it can mean like uh, different things. It's a really like a broad term that people have been using. Uh, so roughly speaking, you can divide it into like three categories depending on like the types of devices that you use to solve and the type of problem uh, or data that you have. Right? For example, you can have like a classical problem and you solve it with like quantum uh, device or you have like a quantum uh, problem and then you solve it with like your quantum computers. So uh, specifically in this talk, we're gonna focus on this area. And uh, so uh, to be more specific, we're gonna use like uh, quantum computers or devices at machine learning model, right? Okay, and uh, so the reason why we want to consider this one is we hope that by using quantum computers as machine learning models, uh, we might be able to achieve a better accuracy uh, as a comparison to the conventional classical machine learning model. Okay, so let me first introduce the uh, model that uh, we use in this study, which is uh, quantum neural networks uh, in QML. So this one is a popular uh, machine uh, quantum model that people have been using. It's not only in QML, it's also in the VQA uh, as well. Uh, so roughly you can think of QNN as like a parameterized quantum circuit where you have like a, the evolution and then in the evolution, you have some parameters that you can tweak. And uh, the machine learning task that we consider here is the supervised uh, machine learning uh, task. And uh, although the result may be able to like uh, extend to some unsupervised learning as well, okay? But uh, to be more specific about this uh, supervised learning, so we are given some uh, training data of like XI and uh, you have like a true label that given to you, YI. So this XI, you can think of it as like, you know, pixel in the picture or and uh, the YI can be the picture of like cat and dog, for example, you want to do the classification in this case. And uh, so before going into the QNN, let me quickly like remind you guys on how we do the uh, classical neural network, right? You have the input data, then you have this uh, classical neural network model, and then you uh, at the end, you have the model prediction as the output. So you're going through this process again and again for, to all your training data set. Then what you have in the end is that you can uh, calculate this loss function. So uh, the choice of the loss function also depends on you like, you can choose like for example you can do like mean square error or like the negative log likelihood and this loss function give you kind of like the uh loss function landscape that you want to uh, kind of like navigate through it in order to find the uh, optimal point so you want to tweak these parameters to find the minimum point in your uh, loss function landscape so you just like keep doing this one iteration by iteration and uh so the graph that you guys may be familiar is something like this, where you have like loss function and then you have iteration and everything just like go down, like the value of the loss function, right? Okay, so now when we have the uh, quantum neural network, you just like, instead of having the classical neural network, you replace that one with your quantum circuit. Uh, here is like 
um, you have parameters here as well in the quantum circuit before in the classical neuron where you have those like weight and biases right in the quantum circuit these parameters uh, that you want to change maybe like your uh, gate rotation angles for example and uh, sin is the uh, quantum device right uh, and if your input is classical input data like a pixel you need to encode it like so that's an additional process of encoding here you want to encode your classical data into your quantum uh, circuit and after that uh, you want to make a measurement out of it usually it's the form of some expectation values and you interpret this one as your model prediction then you just keep doing this one again and again and like this similar to what we have before you can construct this loss function and again you're just going through this uh, loss function landscape to try to find the optimal parameters right and since now we uh we have uh our model as like quantum device it can also handle the quantum data as well so here like your input doesn't have to be only a uh, like pixel or picture anymore it can be like you know it's like quantum state uh in like quantum state in different phases like uh, ferromagnetics or like paramagnetics and your task is to do the classification of uh, given uh, input quantum state okay so before i uh, continue talking about qml let me just like introduce the uh, closely related field of uh, rational quantum algorithms so this is the uh, like the framework that people been like uh, very interested in because it's kind of like suitable for the uh, near term devices that you still have some noise in it right so it's suitable for uh, noisy quantum computers and uh and another reason that people pay so much attention to it because the framework is very generic and uh, you can have like apply it to different uh, problems depending on how you define your loss function okay so the VQA framework is really uh, similar to the QML. Um, so you have like input state, usually it in the like uh, easy to prepare state, like, you know, like tensor product um, or like all up or down, something like that. Then again, you have this uh, quantum neural network, basically it's the parameterized uh, quantum circuit there. And you make some measurement, you have the cost function, uh, which is like the expectation value with respect to uh, some observable. Then again, you have this landscape you want to go down into this landscape. Okay, so the example of uh, the the uh, problem that you can apply this framework to is like finding the ground state of a molecule. Uh, this one you just define your cost function, your H, to be like the molecular Hamiltonian, or like a combinatorial optimization where you just define your H to be like uh, the Hamiltonian of like uh, icing spin chain. Okay. So as I said, uh, these two like settings, they are really uh, like similar to each other. Uh, so let's go through it like one by one on like uh, similarity and differences, right? So uh, in VQA, as I said, like the input is easy to prepare state, you know, it's like product state. However, in the v uh, QML, you have like a training data set and this, uh, and if you have like classical one, you have to do this embedding. You have uh, quantum data, they usually in like, you know, like, comp like not, e not so easy to prepare quantum state. So it's like they are non-trivial state, right? And the cost function, right? In uh, VQA, you have this linear uh, of the expectation value. Yeah. So, yes, so, so can I stop there or interrupt uh, yeah. for a What do you mean by easy to prepare state for VQA? Because they uh, usually use a lot of, for example, the, um, what's the, what's the, what's the ansatz called? The hardware efficient ansatz, right? It has a lot of rotations and entangling rates. Yeah, yeah. Like okay, that. so when, when I said the uh, uh, easy to prepare state here, I mean as like the input, like as your initial state before you adding your rational block. Ah, okay, I see. Right, yeah. So in, in the VQA, for example, if you want to do like quantum chemistry, uh, you start with like a Hartree Fox state, right? Which is basically just you know just uh, one of the uh, your basis, right? It's a product state, right? And then you add this uh, rational uh, circuit, as you said, it can be like hardware efficient if you want uh, 
to to do it that way or you, it can be like a ucc you need to leave a couple cluster if you want it to be like more specific to your problem right so when i i, I say like easy to prepare state i mean as like the input it is not the case for the quantum machine learning right because you have like your uh cloud your your training data and then you do the embedding right and uh and this can lead to like non-trivial state or if you have like quantum data this state usually just like you know not not so trivial like basically not product state right okay and yeah as i said like uh the difference still also in the cost function like the form of the cost function in vqa you have just like one expectation value right you make this linear expectation value in the QML, your loss function is a nonlinear and it's the sum of many terms, right? This F is like highly nonlinear. It can be highly nonlinear. And uh, but note that this uh, model prediction is in the same form as your uh, cost function in the VQA, because it's also the expectation value, right? But the the total form of it is nonlinear and like so many terms. Okay, and the embedding this I already mentioned it a bit. Yeah, sorry. Uh, just can I clarify? So the Y are the target values, is it? Yeah. So the Y I here is the true label. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 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 And yeah. Uh, as I mentioned, you uh have the uh you don't require embedding for the VQA. However, in the QML, if you have you play around with the classical data set, you need the embedding. Okay. So uh one can one can see here that uh this pipe in both frameworks you kind of like you train the parameterized quantum circuit the uh quantum machine learning setup is more complicated than like the vqa in general right so okay so this work is about trainability so before that i want to kind of like make sure that i convince you guys why is why it is important to study the train trainability of this uh quantum neural networks in both like vqa and QML like uh, so in in VQA is straightforward right all we care is that uh, you want to go down you want to get like uh, the best uh, point in your your loss function landscape right you do this uh, optimization and the lower your loss function is the better right so that one is already clear you want like a quality quality of your solution to be good right in QML uh, although you know it's like after you training your model uh, what you actually want to be good is the uh, generalization error. So you want your model to generalize well into the unseen data. However, you still want, in, in order to get that model, you still have to train your model, right? So if you cannot train it, you cannot re really achieve this low generalization error that you hope for. So in both, uh, sorry, in both, uh, in both frameworks, train, tra train, trainability of your model is crucial. Okay, so uh, so basically, uh, that's like this uh coming term that uh people from the uh Leno, they they try to uh like make make sure that like you know it's like it's a try try to make uh use of it. It's like quantum landscape theory. So basically, it's just like you know what features of your quantum neural networks uh can affect trainability and practical usefulness of your Q and N, right? Uh, so what you care, for example, you might care about like the answers of your model. So it's, this one is like specific architecture of your quantum neural network. And uh, you may have heard of it as like what, when, and why gates, right? What are the gate set that you're going to use to construct your uh, QNN when you're going to actually execute those gates and why you use those gates, right? Okay. And um, you might care about like uh, with this answers, with this specific architecture, can we actually capture the solution of the problem that we're looking for right uh, so there are you know multiple way of constructing this uh, rational uh, circuit like uh, you can have like unstructured answers or like hard hardware efficient as uh, uh, can we uh, mention right or you can have like a problem inspired answers like uh, you know in chemistry or you, or like uh, you have this qaoa for example uh, another topic that people have been uh, looking at is the um, about like barring plateaus. So this is like in famous phenomena that kind of like preventing you from training your uh, your quantum 
circuit break. So basically, it's like okay, given that although your 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 circuit may may be able to capture the the solution, can you actually walk through this landscape into the solution that you want? Right? Can you actually efficiently move to the landscape to minimize your loss function? Right? And the key here is all about efficiency. Right? You want to keep uh, by by efficiency, I mean like you want to keep everything like scaling as polynomial in the problem side. Right, your number of shots that you use, like the number of parameters, etc. Okay, so let let talk more about like this Baden Plato's problem. Uh, so the problem about Baden Plato's is about precision, right? And the, the, the reason, uh, is because your quantum computers are probabilistic in nature. So what I mean by that is like you can look at this example. For example, if I have like a qubit in the state row and you want to know the probability of sampling a bit string or zero from your uh, row state right in theory this is very simple for us like you know it's like if you do if you are theorist this like you you always do this you know it's like it just trace of this projector and then that's it you, you have you have the solution however in practice things are not so straightforward so if you want to know this probability you have to make a lot of like uh, measurement shots right and uh, to estimate this probability. And this uh, estimation is like N zero divided by N. Okay, so N here is the total uh, charts that you do, right? And uh, this is not come for free, right? It's not always exactly equal to this. You have like that uh, statistical precision, like the fluctuation plus minus, and the order of the precision is usually in the uh, one over square root N. Right, right, again, and here's the total number of charts. Okay, so Balin Plato's, why is it the problem? So Balin Plato is uh, the situation when your loss function landscape becomes uh, exponentially flat, right? In the most legion of your, of your loss function. They still have some gradient in it, but it's just like exponentially small, right? And uh, the problem with it is, Again, it's like when you try to uh, go, like navigate yourself through it and you uh, you don't have enough measurement chart, right? Uh, let, just, let me just make that more clear. So uh, in practice, when you want to go through this uh, loss function landscape, you can either choose to do like gradient free or gradient based, right? If you do gradient free, you evaluate your uh, loss function at two different points. And if you do the gradient based, you just like, you know, it's like make the uh, small difference, or you can use like uh, the uh, the famous parameter shift rule, right? So whatever what what you whatever you choose to do, what what you have to do is that you have to evaluate your loss function as two different points. And um, again, if like your loss function landscape in uh, in 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 general is like exponentially flat. Uh, the value of your cost function, the difference in the cost function is order of like one over two to the n, right? And here for when you have like four qubits, uh, the this one over two to the n is roughly like 0 0.0625. And to separate it from the statistical noise, you would need like two six five shots, right? That's not so much. However, if you scale that up to like 20 qubits, the precision become like you know 10 to the minus seven. Or, and you need like one trillion shots in order to just you know determine one direction of your parameter, right? And you can imagine imagine that okay the exponent uh the scaling here is exponential. So if you start going up into like larger number of qubits, this quickly become uh intractable. So again, the problem is in scaling, right? And uh, to characterize this Baryon plateaus, usually people uh, the most important thing that you have to look at is the variance of the gradients of your loss function, and this basically telling you that okay, if you randomly pick different points in your landscape, on average you're gonna have like that, uh, it become like exponentially small, right? And uh, so again, so if your loss function doesn't have Baryon plateau it will, you know, it's like, you can just go in through these gradients and maybe like finding your maxima or like minima optimal point basically. However, if you have like Baryon plateaus and you don't have enough measurement shots, 
you're gonna you know the the dominant term that you get is gonna be your statistical noise and in the end what end up is that you're gonna randomly walk around the landscape you know it's like it's just random walk it doesn't lead you to the solution okay and the study of barren titles in vqa it's just like you know people uh there's uh so many study of um uh, Balin Plato is like what features of your QNN that could induce this uh, Balin Plato's in the VQA. You know that can be like the deep circuit and the expressibility of the circuit could lead to this. Uh, if you have like a global measurements, uh, it could also lead to this one. Uh, the noise, right? The entanglement in your uh, quantum state, and uh, you know it's like most of this study has been done in the unstructured ANSAS, or for example, like hardware efficient. So, you know, people, uh, and so for, for quite a long time, people think that people like, you know, if you use kind of like the structure answers, like problem inspired answers, maybe you can escape these barren plateaus. However, uh, the recent study and actually like uh, the talk before my talk by uh, Martin, a uh, very good one. He also showed that even with problem inspired answers like QAO, QAOA, you cannot really, uh, guarantee for sure that you escape these balance plateaus, you know. So it's not, it's not just, you know, it's like you cannot just say that, oh, uh, my answer is problem inspired. There's no problem of this type, right? So, and uh, so the, the, given the large uh, reiterator in the, uh, of BP in the VQA, so it's natural to ask the question, like how does, how does it translate into like the QML setting? So given the reminder that the, the framework of quantum machine learning is generally more complicated than uh, VQA in general, does the result in VQA can be uh, translated into QML, right? It is not, you know, you cannot just say this one for sure, right? And so that brings uh, us to uh, this work. Uh, so before dive, uh, dive down into details, I would like to uh, summarize first the result uh, of our work that we have, right? So the point one that we show is that we regularly show that the gradient scaling result in VQA can be directly uh, applied into the QML setting, right? So this would mean that all the features that are not good for VQA in terms of trainability, you know, it's like those are uh, deep unstructured circuit, like global measurements. Uh, when you construct your QML, you should also avoid these features, right? So, you know, it's like, so this, this uh, arrow is a yes. Okay. And yeah, and the, uh, the, the, the point, second point that we show in this uh, work is that, you know, uh, the, about it, it's about the data set. So in VQA, again, you don't have data set, right? In QL, you have data set. And what we find is that uh, the data set that we use can actually negatively impact the trainability of your quantum machine learning model. And in the worst case, it could even lead to this barren plateaus problem that we just show you, right? So, uh, so to straight this is the new phenomena. Uh, you don't have this in VQA because again, you don't have the data set there. And um, this is mostly little when, when you're dealing with the classical data set, right? Because, uh, there, you, you know, it's like you have a freedom of choosing how to embed your classical data into the quantum state, right? It's the choice. And if you choose it poorly, it could lead to this trainability issue. Okay, and uh, the last point is maybe it's a bit separated from the first two, but it's also important. Uh, so because like, you know, it's, uh, when, when, we look, when we look at the uh, loss function, we also look at like different types of loss function. And one of the loss function that we look at is this uh, log likelihood loss function. And it turns out that is this log likelihood loss function is closely related to the classical feature information, right? And uh, so what we show is that the optimization that relying on this feature information, for example, the natural gradients, or uh, if you want to do some like, you know, trick, for example, like you normalize this uh, feature information and you use it to train your uh, landscape, we show that this uh, doesn't help you get rid of the barren plateau. You would still require this exponential uh, measurement charts in order to navigate through the uh, landscape. Okay, so that's roughly the summary of 
our work. Uh, so let me just go a bit more into details. Uh, let first remind of the setup that we have, right? Uh, so we have the data set, right? You have the classical data set, or you can have like quantum, right? If you have classical data set, you have to do this encoding uh, step, right? You do the encoding. Here we consider it to be like CPTP map. So it's very general, right? You do this uh, encoding, then you have like quant some quantum state. And next, uh, after you uh, have the quantum, like uh, quantum data set, right? You gonna put it through this parameterized quantum channel or it's like QNN, okay? Here again, we, we consider it to be like parameterized CPTP map. And uh, in the end, you make uh, some uh, measurements, basically, um, and you interpret it as like model prediction. So you have that one, and you have the loss function, right? And here, uh, we, don't, we, don't, we, we don't specify what is this F just yet, right? Uh, the only requirement we, we need is that it is the first order differentiable. Right. So you can see that this setup is very uh, general and you know it's like no specific form of channels or like type of the loss function. So that's why uh, our result can be uh, applied to many different cases. Okay, so the point one that we uh, that I mentioned before is we connecting the result of VQA to the QML, right? And uh, okay, so don't uh, afraid of this theorem just yet. Let's just go through it like uh, bit by bit, right? So what we actually do is like, you can look at this equation 15. So the L here is the uh, loss function of your QML and the LI here is the model prediction that you have. So uh, roughly speaking, this equation 15 tell you that uh, we you, you can upper bound the variance of your uh, gradient of your loss QML loss function with the variance of the gradient of the model prediction. And why is it important? that we can show this one. Uh, so remember that the model prediction is a linear expectation value and it's in the same form as a cost function in the VQA. So that's why, uh, you know, it's like, that's how we manage to link uh, between VQA and QML framework, right? So basically to analyze the variance of this uh, model prediction, you can use those uh, already out there VQA result to do that. Okay, and uh, here in equation 16, you, you can see that this theorem one also depend on like your GI. So this GI is basically, uh, uh, you know, it's like you can specify the, the type of the loss function that you use and you, you, you can calculate this GI, right? It depends on the type of the, the loss function that you use. And uh, if the loss function that you use is, have the, is this GI, happen to be polynomial in the number of qubit. Uh, what you can show is that if uh, the, if the uh, variance of the model prediction has BP on the right hand side is gonna be exponentially small, right? That would mean that the variance of your uh, QML loss function also has BP, right? And again, the point here is to show that, you know, it's like the features that are not so good for the VQA trendability should be avoided in the QML as well. Right. And uh, to show uh, some example that this GI is quite easy to satisfy, basically it's just polynomial. Uh, so we consider the two uh, well-known loss function in the machine learning. So mean square error and like negative log likelihood. Uh, and we, we just find that, okay, it's satisfied that condition. So if you have balin plateaus in your uh, linear loss function, you have Baryon Plato in these two types of loss function as well, right? Okay, so the next point is the uh, the data set induced Baryon Plato's. Uh, the key here is to understand that the data set is actually just a collection of quantum state, right? And uh, by that, it's just like, you know, when you have data set, it's just basically you changing your initial state before putting it into this uh, rational block. Right, so in VQA, it kind of like well known that you know changing initial state do not help you avoiding balin plateaus in, you know, if your QNN architecture already has BP, right, and uh, so this fact together with theorem one, we show that you know 
uh, the data set, at least it cannot help you escaping the Berlin plateaus. Okay. What is worse is that, you know, uh, if you have some initial quantum state or the data set, it can even lead to the Berlin plateaus, even if your QA instructor does not have like unfavorable feature, right? And uh, to understand this is, you know, in the, uh, you can understand this in the aspect of entanglement, right? Because uh, you have this entanglement BP. Uh, so basically this, what, what it says that if you have the initial quantum state and it has too much entanglement, it already satisfied the condition of the entanglement BP and you will have barring petal even though your uh, rational block doesn't have it. Or you can just look at it at, in this way, right? Any quantum state is basically, you can start with the product state and you apply some uh, circuit into it, then you get that state, right? And if that an evolution, you know, contains some feature that is not favorable for trainability, then the output quantum state will not we will have this barren plateaus. Okay. So uh, to look more into the detail here, we also chose some toy example. You know, it's like we choose the rational part such that all is favorable for trainability. You know, it's like you have just product of local unitary blocks. You make a local measurements. So this architecture, uh, usually if you just do it in VQA, you will not have barren plateaus, right? So basically you can show that the variance of this one is scaled as equation 20, right? And um, so standard VQA does not have BP. Uh, in this equation 20, what is different, uh, what is important is this uh, Huber Smith distance between the uh, reduced state and the maximally mixed state, right? However, if your data set has BP, uh, the data set in the QML can make uh, your uh, QML sus susceptible to the BP, even in this simple setting, right? So basically, if this reduced state is exponentially to the maximum limit, state, the equation 20 will tell you that the variance of uh, your model prediction has BP, right? And again, the implication here is uh, mostly important when you're dealing with the classical data. Okay, so in the quantum data, your role is given, so you cannot do much on that. However, in the classical data, you can play around with it. So what we say is that choose your choice of embedding carefully, right? Okay. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. So, so a good choice of embedding would be such that the state is separable. Will you say that? Uh, the, for the entanglement induced BP. So what, what we say is that uh, it, is not separable. It should lead. It should not lead to too much entanglement in your uh, final in your embedded state. So as best as possible, the best case would be separable. So okay, actually, uh, that's like so. This, this what what we show here is that this is an additional criteria, right? That you 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 would need when you uh build this uh embedding. And actually, before you already have like a few criteria that you have to satisfy. For example, uh, your embedding should not uh, uh, be classically simulatable, and that that is basically what you just uh, what, what what you mentioned, right? Uh, so it 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 has been shown that if your embedding is classically simulatable, what you're gonna get out of your quantum machine learning model will not be better than the uh, classical uh, computers, right? And uh, it has to also be like practical, useful, right? It 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 cannot be only like you know, it's everything is uh, unsimulatable and it will automatically mean everything is good, right? It has to you know, cannot simulate it. Second is like, uh, it has to lead to something good before you have that two criteria. Now it just add more complication into like how you are gonna decide the embedding, which is like it has to also not lead to this BP. So this is tricky. Eh? So it has to be yeah. not classically simulatable, but it also cannot be too entangled. Like yeah, you mentioned. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's luck luckily that, so that two things usually go together, right? But it is not, you know, it's not kind of like one-to-one. -one. You can have highly entangled state, but is, and uh, 
sorry, you can have the, the quantum state that is cannot be cl classically uh, simulated, but does not uh, have too much entanglement. Right. Usually these two things go together, but you know, it's not, it's not, the, it's not the necessary uh, requirement. But yes, it's, as you said, it's, it's making things become like more tricky. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks. Yeah, and th thanks for the question, yeah. And uh, the final point is, uh, so actually I don't want to talk much about this one, uh, is like, you know, it's, if you look at this negative log likelihood, you have, uh, is in this form. And if you look at the classical feature information, uh, it's in this form. So you can see that it's really uh, related. And uh, what we show is that if uh, the terms in the log, uh, log likelihood uh, lead to the BP, uh, in the linear cost, right, which is this term, uh, your classical feature information, the matrix elements are going to be exponentially small, right? Uh, intuitively, you can, you can just think of it as like, okay, this term is exponentially small. This one is exponentially small times exponentially small. So it's something like that, right? And uh, the uh, implication is that, you know, it's like optimizer that based on the feature information technique, like natural gradient require exponentially number of charts. And uh, if you want to normalize this feature information, it's also require exponentially number of charts as well, right? So the reason we mentioned this one is, you know, it's like some people, they, they try to, sometimes they try to go around this one by just, you know, okay, uh, feature information is not good. So what happened if we just normalize it? can we get rid of the BP, right? So here we, we show that you cannot do it, right? Uh, okay, to back up, uh, to support our theoretical finding, we also like look at the numerical result, uh, numerical simulation as well. Just, I'll just be super brief about this one. Uh, so we, what we look at the, is the binary classification. We, uh, we look at two different data set. So the randomly generated one and the MNIST data set. Uh, we look at three different embeddings, right? You have this one is, you know, it's just the single rotation. Uh, this one is the hardware efficient. And uh, this one is the, uh, uh, what we, we call it classically hard to simulate uh, embedding, right? Because it's actually based on uh, the quantum supremacy proposal, IQP, right? And so this is for the embedding part for the QNN. Uh, you have like a layer of RY rotation and the quantum convolution neural network and the measurement you can have like global and local parity. Okay, so so for the point one, uh, the key here is that, you know, you, you make the setup such that uh, you want to observe the BP in your rational quantum algorithms, right? In your VQA, which is the linear. And you see what would happen to... Uh, other loss functions. In this case, it's the local atomic and the mean square error. So you can see that in all of the cases, everything is exponentially decay. Right. Uh, for the point two, data set induced BP. So the setup here is that you try to make uh, your circuit have feature that does not induce BP in VQA. For example, it, it should be like, you know, uh, so here you, you, you have like a, a single layer of Hawaii rotation with local measurement or like the quantum convolution neural network with like, uh, so if it QCNN is already local. So the point is that this setup is like, it should not lead to BP. And uh, what we do is that we increase the complexity of the embedding layers uh, of the data embedding by increasing the number of layers. Okay, so before, right, you have this one, you just, you know, you just keep adding them, right? One by one, more and more. So basically that lead to more entanglement, like the difference between the uh, reduced state and the maximally entangled state. Once you uh, uh, layer increasing, it's going down exponentially. And you can observe that, you know, uh, with more layers, the variance going down. So basically showing our point. And the, the last one is, you know, we have this relationship with feature information. Uh, we show that if your log loss function has BP, and uh, your feature information also has BP as well. So we look at this one, we look at the trace, which is the sum of feature information elements. And we look at the, uh, the distribution of the uh, eigenstate of the feature information. Right. Okay, so the uh, conclusion is like, 
Okay, there's three points we show this word. One is that the result in VQA, you can use it to QML. Uh, the second one is we show additional complication when you want to decide your, uh, your embedding, like uh, the data set is like, is crucial to, to consider and is related to the trainability of your QML, right? And the last one is about the feature information. Basically it's like if your log has the feature information, if individual terms in the log has the feature information in it, uh, you cannot use this natural gradient or like normalize your feature information. Okay, and uh, this work is obviously not uh, done by me alone. Uh, I have like some great help from uh, this guy, uh, like Samsung Wong uh, from Imperial, like uh, Anne, uh, Patrick Coase, and like Marco, both from the uh, LandL and uh, I'm really happy to work with these people. They're all brilliant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thanks, Superman, for the very pedagogical talk. Yeah. Uh, yeah, any questions from the from the rest? I just have a question. So um I I, I understand the limitation of con current quantum computers because um and it's forcing us to use like hardware efficient ansatz or ansatz like um, the, 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 the third ansatz that you're showing, uh, quantum supremacy ansatz. Um, do, you, do you have any insight or results? If what we were to use ansatz, they were more problem aware. So like they are not just like hardware efficient, but they are actually more design so i mean coming like coming from the vq i mean i'm thinking about it like coming from the vqa in vqa the hardware efficient answer is that is doesn't really have any uh have any relationship to the hamiltonian that is being solved yeah. the hamiltonian but yeah. there have been some proposals like the ucc answers and all that that have been proposed that are taking into account the the properties of the Hamiltonian. And uh, I'm not sure whether there's any work that be done to see if those ansatz are actually able to avoid the worst case of the barren plateau problem. Yeah, yeah, so that's like, uh, okay, let me just show this one. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, so there are, there are like, so before, right, people believe that you know, it's like if you use problem inspired answers, you will not get these barren plateaus because, you know, it's like you include the information of the problem into how you uh, construct your circuit, right? But re very recently, as uh, this word, if you want to look at it, just this one, uh, they, so they, they show that, okay, even uh, in problem inspired answers, you are not guaranteed uh, to, to get rid of this BP, right? I so then they show it for the QAOA case. Yeah. Yes, yes. yeah. And actually, like the, the, the first author, like Martin, he just gave the talk in this like uh, uh QML journal club just before 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 my talk. So you can you can look that up as well. Okay. So yeah. Bruno, when you talk about the fissure information, but um, you're talking about classical fissure information, right? Yep, yeah, here, here, yeah, here everything is classical, uh, classical fissure information. But yeah. most people they are using quantum fissure information to do quantum natural gradient kind of, kind of thing. Yeah, right? that yeah. So uh so I I I think I'm I'm not so sure if our result is directly applied to that. Uh so there is the 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 uh, the reason we can uh, make this link is again is because you know it's like in theorem one we show the link uh, with the uh, in in corollary one we show the link with the uh, log likelihood loss function and it just happened that the feature information uh, and the log likelihood loss function they, they are closely related that's why we can do like one two three uh, for the quantum feature information I I believe that uh, the, the form is different and the, the result may not be directly translated. Yeah. Okay, thanks, thanks. Yeah. 
so that is actually one one direction that you know it's like if uh, people want want to go is just to see if the uh, the quantum natural gradient can help you escaping this like BP. Any other questions for Supernu? If not, then yeah, we can thank Supernu again for the for the great talk. Right. And yeah, so Supernu, uh, the talk will be recorded and then you'll be put on the YouTube channel, I think. So yeah. I think Yvonne or someone will contact you when they are done processing the talk. Yeah. And you know, if like you guys uh, have any further questions or like anyone watching from YouTube, they have like further questions, just contact me. Yeah. Sure, sure. We have to, to talk and discuss. Thanks for, thanks again for the talk.